Welcome to Dental All-Stars. I'm Eric Vickery, Lead Mastery Coach at All-Star Dental Academy and President of Vickery Coaching. And I'm so excited to welcome back our guest today, Dr. Lauren Levine, founder and president of The Digital Dentist. He has over 30 years invested in the dental and dental technology fields, a graduate of USC. He earned his DMD from Boston University and completed his residency at the Eastman Dental Center in Rochester, New York. You got both coasts covered here, right? I mean, you got California, you got New York. On purpose. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. He received his specialty training at the University of Washington and went into private practice in Vermont until moving to California in 2002 to establish TDD, a company which focuses on the specialized technological and HIPAA needs of the dental community. Dr. Levine has vast experience with dental technology systems. He is a CompTIA certified A plus computer repair technician and a CompTIA network certified technician. Dr. Levine writes for many well-known industry publications and lectures across the country. I know you've all seen him everywhere. He is everywhere you turn. <laughs> he was the regular uh, technology columnist for Dental Economics Magazine. I know you've heard of that one. His articles have appeared in Dentistry Today, Dental Economics, Dental Equipment and Materials, Dental Practice Report, New Dentist, Dental Angle Online, and Dental Town Magazine. He's lectured at the Yankee Dental Congress, American Academy of Periodontology, American Academy of Endodontics, the Dental Town Extravaganza, and numerous state dental society and study club lectures. In addition, he is a member of the Speaking and Consulting Network, he is also the former technology consultant for the Indian Health Service. So welcome, Dr. Levine. <laughs> we have any time left for the presentation? We use it all up with my intro. I, I love when it says short bio. I'm like, yeah, short bio. I mean, you have been everywhere. And I mean, it doesn't take much for people to look somewhere and see your name and see you out there and dealing with these technology issues that we run into, and especially the ransomware. And I hear that word ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. And when I was managing a practice, I walked in one time and there was this, this, I don't know, black screen and it had like the United States flag on it. It's the federal government, this, and you've been locked out for something. And so I know there's, there's people out there who have issues and, and I know there are people who haven't been hit at all. So, so fill us in. What, what is this term ransomware? Is it really that big of a deal? How lucky am I that I haven't been hit? What, What's, what's, what's the big picture here of all this? So yeah, ransomware is a big deal. Um, certainly since COVID hit, it's become a significantly bigger deal. One of the things with ransomware, of course, is their ability to get onto your network and do their damage. Much easier to do that when no one's in the office monitoring the systems day to day. Uh, gotcha. Ransomware is basically a class of what we call malware, viruses. Uh, its main way that it functions is to lock your files and then demand a you know, quote unquote ransom in order to get that unlock key. It is a huge deal, what we're actually seeing. And if you've been following the news, anyone that watches the news has heard, has heard about this. You know, We heard about Colonial Pipeline and JBS Foods and yep. Kaseya, and you know, there were 400 dental offices that were hit in Wisconsin a couple of years ago and 100 in Colorado. So it, it's always in, in the news. Um, why the way it's becoming a bigger deal is that now you have these companies who are creating the ransomware virus, but they don't actually try to infiltrate your network. They lease the software to other bad actors. They go ahead and try to get into your network. And if they're successful and then they collect the ransom, they pay uh, that company that wrote the software a percentage of their proceeds. It's usually like 15, 20%. So wow. it's basically, you know, we've all heard of software as a service, it's ransomware as a service. They're literally selling this service wow. to anyone that wants it. As far as being lucky, it depends on why you haven't been hit. Uh, for most offices, the answer is yeah, they're being lucky. You know, just some, some numbers. I did a web webinar on this a few weeks ago. So over the last year, when you look at all healthcare organizations, 34% were hit with ransomware. Which is wow. Basically a third have been hit with ransomware. Um, of those people that said they were hit, almost two thirds, 65% said that the cyber criminals were successful in encrypting their data. So once they get in, you have a better 
you know, a two in three chance that they're going to actually be able to, to lock the files. Less than half, only 44% said that they use backups to restore data, um, which doesn't always help you. We can talk about that. 34%, um, again, that number again, of those people whose data was encrypted, they ended up paying the ransom. So a third of the people did pay the ransom. Uh, but one of the key things to understand in all of this is that on average, only 69% of the encrypted data was restored after they paid the ransom. In other words, oh, wow. you are, even if you get the unlock key, which isn't a guarantee, even if you are successful in unlocking most of your files, on average, close to a third of your files will still remain locked afterwards. And, so, and yeah, it's, a I'm, it's a big deal. I, and I'm curious, since you said paid the ransom, what, what are, what's the typical small business going to be required to pay to get that, that key? It's gone up significantly. So there was a study done. Um, again, I'm looking, I'm trying to remember where I drew this from. Yeah. The typical ransomware attack <clears throat> lasts uh, about 7.3 days from the time you're hit with the virus, to the time you're uh -huh. back and running. Now that's longer than we would typically take in order to get someone up and running. Uh, the big issue with ransomware is not restoring the files from a backup, for example, or getting you back up and running. The big concern is making sure that you've eliminated the ransomware from the system. You know, if you restore and you it's haven't gotten rid of it, yeah. you're just going to go back to, to where you were. Got it. Um, and we, uh, the number that I saw was somewhere around $65,000, which also includes downtime. Um, but that's standard, you know, across all industries, I say across healthcare, the average ransom paid, and of course, we're talking about hospitals as well, large healthcare organizations, mm -hmm. was 1.27 million. But for smaller businesses, we're normally seeing, it used to be, if you asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said, Five to ten thousand on average. Um, now we're seeing fifty to seventy-five thousand. Seems to be more of the the going rate, especially if they know that they hit a dental office. Because you know, as we all know, you put the word dentist in front of something, and the price goes up. So um, oh. it's, it's pretty significant. And and of course, there's all kinds of other things we'll have to, we we can talk about HIPAA how it relates to that because um, now you're looking at fines and penalties and all kinds of nasty stuff as well. Yeah, that is just outrageous. Talk about hyperinflation, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great business model if you think about it. Man. Uh, you have a captive audience. You're charging them a lot of money. Uh, you know, they don't have many, any options. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about, for example, that 34% you know, of those paid the, ransom, paid the ransom. The reason for that, what we're actually seeing more of over the last little while is what's called... Um, it's double, I'm trying to think what the actual word, not encryption, it's a double and not embezzlement, but it's, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a, basically a, a double system where not only, so let's say you get the note that says, hey, pay the ransom. And you say, you say no, I don't think so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just restore my backup. I've got a good backup and it didn't get affected. These, these cyber criminals are gonna say, okay, well, you don't wanna pay the ransom, that's fine we're going to take all your data and put it online. So it doesn't make a difference if you've got a backup now, because they know, you know, the last thing you want is to see your patient data put online. So uh, mm -hmm. it's basically, you know, they have multiple ways they can nail you, uh, even if you do happen to have a backup, which is the way that most offices would recover, that you restore the, the backup. So it really is no good way to recover from this. And it sounds like the only way to really deal with it is more from the prevention standpoint, which is what we're here to talk about today, of course. Yeah. And I know that, you know, you and I have been talking about uh, just different companies hit, uh, IT companies that even manage dental offices. Tell, what's that all about? Yeah, so the one that was in the news a lot over the last month or so is a company called Kaseya. Almost all of us in the IT field, or not all, almost all, but a lot of us are what's called managed service providers. And one of the things that we do as a managed, and it's basically a fancy way of saying automation. Um, okay. As a managed service provider, one of the things that almost all of us use is what's called RMM, remote management and monitoring. It's our way, because most of us have clients that are out of state or you know, not around sure. the corner, we need a way that we can get onto their systems to, to do troubleshooting, to upload files, to, you know, to do whatever we, we need to do. 
So if you think about the cons of them, let's say you're a cyber criminal and you want to try to hit dental offices or, or medical offices, you know, they're, they're very lucrative. And that's one thing that, that people should keep in mind is not that I spend a lot of time on the black market. Medical dental records are far and away the most valuable commodity on the black market is, you know, a typical dental record is going to have patient's name, uh, their date of birth, their address, their social security number, most likely their credit card information, perhaps copies of the driver's license, wow. all in there. So Which then they steal their identity is what they're trying to do. Correct. So if you think about it from a cyber criminal standpoint, but you have a choice. Let's say there are 400 offices that you want to hit. You can try manually, individually to get to each one of those 400 offices, which might take you weeks or months. Or you say to yourself, wait a second, I know that there are dental IT companies that have these portals. Um, and that portal is access to that remote management monitoring. If I can get into that portal, just get in through one barrier, I now have access to every one of those clients of that IT company. That's exactly what happened with those 400 offices in Wisconsin, is that their IT provider um, did not have proper security in place uh, to prevent uh, unauthorized access. Someone got into their portal and was able to push out that ransomware to 400 clients simultaneously. Wow. Now with Kaseya, it was a little bit different. It wasn't actually anything that they necessarily did on their part. It actually turned out that there was a vulnerability in the Kaseya software um, that allowed people to then be able to get into uh, you know these IT companies thing, but that it would that the damage from that was significantly more because my understanding is that they hit around fifteen hundred different companies. Kaseya as a remote management and monitoring software is the number one used by IT companies by by small business IT companies. We we don't use it. We tried it years ago. It just didn't meet our needs. Um, but it's the number one out there. Now, if according to Kaseya, around 40,000 people were hit. Uh, the ransomware criminals said it was around a million. Uh, I would imagine it's probably closer to the million than it is to the 40,000, but you know, I don't think either one of them are telling the truth necessarily. You know, Kaseya wants to downplay it and yeah. ransomware people want to you know, pump up the number, but I would not be surprised if it was multiple hundreds of thousands of end users that, that got hit with the ransomware. This is everywhere on all sorts of levels. I mean, personally, last week, so I think two weeks ago, my my visa, I, I saw a charge on there. I'm like, I didn't do that. It was it was literally over a weekend. I was like, that's not me. It was for over $800. And then maybe five days later, my debit card. And so, you know, it, it's just everybody's trying to steal this information and we're all being affected by it differently. And, and I heard you say, you know, social security number, identity. So I guess that ties into the HIPAA side of things as well, right? To a certain degree, yes. So one of the things that people probably aren't aware, and I imagine those 400 offices in Wisconsin may not have known about it, is that back in 2016, Health and Human Services, which is part of the Office of Civil Rights, you know, they were asked the question, if you're hit with ransomware, have you suffered a breach? And yeah. their answer was yes. Now, most of us don't think of breaches like that. When we think of a breach, we think of, well, someone hacked into my network or uh, I had a laptop or an external hard drive that wasn't encrypted that got stolen. The way that they define a breach of the civil rights is loss of control of your data, which is exactly what a ransomware does. It locks the files and prevents you from having access to them. Even if, you know, it can only be for a short period of time, but it, it's still considered a breach. Now, they, they set up four parameters and said, listen, you know, if there's a very low risk of there being, a, you know, the, of that data being identified, uh, then, you know, you can basically say, hey, I don't think I need to declare this as yeah. a breach. But those things are almost impossible to answer affirmatively to. So, the, you know, the, some of the questions are, um, is the data, does it not really contain a whole lot of patient information? Well, it's your practice management software. Of course, it's going to contain data. Everything. Yeah. Do you know the person who actually accessed the data? No, you don't. Do you know for sure that they didn't actually view the data? No, you have no clue if they viewed the data or not. The only thing that you can usually answer yes to is, you know, have you mitigated the, the threat? And, you know, yes, for everybody by the end of however long it takes, a day, two days, seven days, you can get rid of the ransomware. 
So if, if every dental office would basically fail on three of those four criteria, more or less they've suffered a breach. And the challenge with a breach is that unlike a lot of HIPAA, which is somewhat ambiguous, that some of it's open to interpretation, there's what's called addressable rules, the breach notification rules are unbelievably strict and clear. If you suffered a breach, you have to notify all your patients in writing, not an email, you gotta send out a letter to them. Uh, you have to notify the local news media. You have to be listed on the Health and Human Services website. We call it the wall of shame. It's not a oh. place to be. Um, and all that stuff is if, if you have five, for, for notifying the patients, if you, is, is, if you have more than 10 patients, which everyone does, yeah. The, um, the local media and the website is if you have 500 or more patients, but that's still almost every dental office is going to have more than 500 patients. So it's, it's horrible. You can imagine sending out that letter to your patients. We've had offices that have had to do that. On average, they lose 15, 20% of their patient population. People are like, I don't want to go back there. You know, you lost my data. I, I trusted you with this, wow. with this data. So, you know, that's how HIPAA kind of ties in with all of this is that, you know, it's not enough to just get rid of that virus. You know, if you have, if you got hit, you basically have suffered a breach and have to act accordingly. And those repercussions, it seems like they just keep coming and you can't, <laughs> can't run away from it at all. It keeps chasing you down. You know, and this brings up a thought that, you know, I deal with as a coach, you know, offices saying, Hey, you know, every now and then we're going to have a, a patient who doesn't pay their bill and we've got to send them to collection agency. And we can't send them if we don't have a social security number. And now patients are saying, oh, no, I'm not giving you my social security number for this very reason. And it is all connected. And so do you, do you ever offer coaching for verbiage to, to team members on what they can say to a patient when the patient's maybe hesitant to give their personal information to the dental office? Yeah, we do. Um... You know, by law, your staff needs to be trained on HIPAA compliance. And there's a number of online one, ones that we work with where, you, you know, on an annual basis, you do some HIPAA training. Um, certainly, you, you can coach. You know, listen, as we all know, some patients are just difficult. I think, you know, you, I think if you can show them that you're taking the steps necessary, show them or be able to say to them, yes, you know, but we encrypt all the data. We're using this program. We're, we're doing this type of encryption. Here's how we back it up. Here's what we have in place to prevent people from getting in. If you can help to settle those fears, um, that's basically all you can do. You know, if someone's not going to give it to you, then you've got the decision of, is this someone I want in my practice or not? Uh, it's not, you know, a common occurrence. You know, I would think it's a fairly small percentage of people that are against that. But, you know, as people hear more and more about ransomware, like you said, they're going to be a little more hesitant to give up that critical information. Yeah, it is a challenge. And we have to make sure that we're using the right, the right verbiage and make sure it's a win-win for the patient yeah, and if, the practice. If you're hit, if, even though it's not part of the breach notification rule, it's considered standard of care that you provide some type of credit monitoring for those people for at least a year. Wow. So that's part of why it gets so expensive. I mean, when we do HIPAA risk assessments for our clients and put together management plans, we always bundle in at least $250,000 of cyber wow. liability insurance, because you just never know. And you know, you can't, you cannot get 100% HIPAA compliant. There's 700 pages of rules and regulations. Uh, you know, you hear about these major fines and penalties and these, you know, these large healthcare organizations, they've got multiple people you know, that are HIPAA compliance officers on their payroll. And if they can't get compliant, what chance do you have? But that doesn't mean you can't make a good faith effort to get there. So yeah, that's where we focus on with our clients is that core list of, you know, about nine, 10 things that offices really need to do to get themselves more compliant. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's just too much to be aware of. And there's, I think there's so many business owners, doctors winging it. They don't think, oh, I'm too small. Nobody's going to come after my stuff, you know? So you mentioned before about, you know, the, the cyber uh, criminals going through the management software in that company and said, we don't use that. And then I've also heard about, you know, there's new ways of dealing with malware called whitelisting. And so are those two things connected or is that two different degree. things? So, yeah, okay. so the term is, there's, there's two new terms that people may not be familiar with. There's one that's called application whitelisting, another one called ring fencing. So I, I want to maybe step back a, a second just to say, okay. say 
when it comes to, to ransomware and malware, there's basically a three-pronged approach that you want to take. You want to stop it from getting into your network in the first place. If it is going to get into your network, you want to be able to deal with it in one way. And if it does, you know, still manage to get through all that, you want to have some way of recovery. Right. So the way that you stop it from getting in in the first place, there's two things you should be doing. One is you should have a firewall in place. I'm not talking about the firewall that's built into your cable model. I'm talking like a real <laughs> business class firewall. You know, companies like Sophos and SonicWall, you're going to have to spend a little bit more for that. You know, you're going to spend six, $700 for a really good firewall, but that's what it's designed to do is to keep that bad stuff out. The other thing, which again, there's a HIPAA law for this is what's called patch management. Even though email is far and away the most common way that malware gets into your network, the second most common way is unpatched software. Every software program out there has security holes in them. And the companies produce patches on a regular basis. But for other than something like Windows, there's no easy way for you to know, hey, there's a patch. I got to go ahead and download it. I got to update it. Um, that's one of the things we do as managed service providers is we do this thing. It's called patch management. Like I said, it, it is a HIPAA lot. You have to be patching it. So that's what, those are the two things you would normally do to keep the bad guys out. The second way is, well, let's say they get through. How do we deal with it? Everyone should have some basic general antivirus software. Those companies will tell you, we do a really good job against the, the ransomware viruses. In my experience, that's not the case. You're going to want to supplement it with ransomware specific software. There's programs like Hitman Pro and Intercept X. You know, they're all designed just for ransomware. But the challenge with those is that what we're seeing more and more of is what's called a zero day infection. And what that basically means is that the ransomware is so new that your antivirus software, your anti ransomware doesn't know that it's a virus. It, it's literally brand new. They, they have, you know, so, you know, oftentimes within a day or two, they can have it in place, but by then it may be too late for you. Too late. Yeah. So this concept of application whitelisting, it, it's a very technical way of dealing with it, but the, the explanation I think is relatively easy for most people to understand. All ransomware, all viruses, all malware are just tiny little programs. It's the series of instructions. With ransomware, it would be, you know, get on the network, uh, hide yourself, disable the antivirus software, encrypt the files, leave a ransom note, you know, re remove yourself, you know, whatever things it does. It's, they're not difficult programs as far as what they do. So the way that application whitelisting works is to say, okay, well, you have lots of programs running on your computers, which are perfectly fine. So let's go ahead, let's take an inventory of all the programs that are running on your system. We can compare that with other companies or other people that have you know, similar types of offices to make sure, you know, to put it all into this big global database of acceptable software. At a certain point, usually about a week or two, we then flip the switch. Any new program that tries to run can't run. It's not on that white list of approved programs. So a malware tries to get on there, immediately it's going to be stopped. It's, it's nice. not going to be able to run. Now, the only time it ever becomes a pain for the office is, and it's usually, it's a first person pain. What I mean by that, let's say you're an open dental user and they just released a, a new update to their software. You go to run that update and the threat block, which is the software that we use, it says, wait, hold on a second here. This isn't on my approved list. It sends us a, an alert that we go into our, our threat block portal. We say, okay, this is fine, it's from open dental. The whole process takes around 90 to 120 seconds, give or take. That's seconds, not minutes. It's almost instantaneous. And at that point, it's now approved. But we then say to the system, okay, we've approved this. Make sure that it's approved across all of our client base, not just that one person. Got it. Whoever's the un unlucky person, the first one to install you know, the update, they've got to wait a couple of minutes to, to get that approved. Everyone else will not see that error message because it's already gotten through. Got it. Defensing is kind of like application whitelisting. It's, we have to set it up on our end a little bit more. Ring fencing says, hey, let's say you've got an open dental database. Here are the programs that are allowed to access that database. Open dental can access it. Um, you know, if you have an image software, XDR, you know, Terex, they can access it. If you're using a a patient reminder system, a YAPI, a solution, you know, they can access it. But we say, 
here are the programs that can access this database, nothing else. So it kind of works the same way, but it's basically putting the fence, that's why they call it ring fencing. You're putting the fence to say, only these programs have access to that program database, nothing else can do it. Um, so that honestly, of all the things that we do in IT, in dental IT, this has me more excited than anything else out there. We beta tested it for six months before we started uh, about three, four months ago, offering it to, to our clients uh, or anyone else that, that obviously that wants it. Um, we have not seen a single virus, a single ransomware affect any of our clients since we installed that software. That wasn't the case if they had antivirus, like, antivirus, like those 400 offices in Wisconsin, almost all of them had ransomware or antivirus software running, uh, but it didn't pick it up. Uh, but we've not had that happen to a single person. So uh, it's, it's got me excited because that's something we always want to be able to provide to people is that peace of mind to say, hey, we're pretty confident that even if it gets through the firewall, even if it gets through the patch software, even if your antivirus software and anti ransomware doesn't recognize it, we still have a way of saying, hey, we don't approve this program, it's not running. Uh, but now, if somehow it gets through that, which like I said, we've never seen that, then you go to your third line of defense, which is restoring the backup, uh, yeah. which is not, it used to be years ago, I would tell people that that's the way we'd always do it um, because of the fact that we had never seen ransomware hit a backup. That's yeah. no longer the case. We've seen it happen quite a lot. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you know, with the double extortion, it still isn't going to help you if, you know, if they've they put it out there to, to release your data. So, yeah, that's like I said, in IT, it's hard for me to get excited because <laughs> yeah, this is stuff I do every day. And I, mean, I love what I do, but to have this new technology, it's not something we would ever recommend that dental offices try to set up on their own. Most of the people that that would offer application whitelisting won't allow you to even buy it. You know, you've got to go through uh, an IT company. It, like I said, it's a, it's a relatively easy concept. The back end of that takes us hours and hours and hours to set it up for each office to make sure that it's running properly, that we set up you know, the proper exclusions, that we get it all included in the, in the global database. We do the ring fencing. It's, it's less and less work as we go on, as we get more and more clients uh, on board, but it's still something that uh, you don't want to be doing on your own. That's what I was just going to ask. Is this something dentists can or should do on their own? So no. does he answer that question? <laughs> no, as I said, you can't buy it. And for most offices, it's not horribly, I mean, it's, it's not cheap. I, I won't lie to offices, but it depends on your definition of cheap. You know what I mean? The, the retail price is usually around a couple hundred bucks a month per office. We've actually managed that, that we're offering it to anyone that's on the, this uh, presentation we can get it down to 99 bucks a, a month. You know, it's a yearly contract because we have to prepay for it for the, with the vendors. But you know, my, my mindset, again, it's not my money, so it's easy for me to say this, but I say, listen, 100 bucks a month to have the peace of mind that nothing is going to be able to affect your data. Wow, um, yeah. That's to me a lot better than two days of downtime. And you know, as I said, if that number, you know, approximately $65,000 that you're out, um, and that's just, you know, the downtime, the ransomware you pay. Now you've got to declare a HIPAA breach. There's fines, there's penalties, there's legal fees, there's the credit monitoring. That's why we do the $250,000 of insurance, because you're going to probably end up using a significant chunk of that, uh, you know, to, to recover. Yeah, it's like one of those visa commercials. How much is it to do this? They start listing all the money and at the bottom it says, the embarrassment of having to announce the data breach is, is priceless. You know, yeah, it's just priceless. that yeah. they, I don't think you put a dollar amount on that. Like you said, patients leaving and word of mouth gets very, very uh, embarrassing and it can have a long-term effect on your practice. I, I can absolutely see that. So, yeah. all right. So you mentioned an offer right, for people listening. So what you're saying is they can get this ring fencing for basically $99 a month. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Correct. Yeah. One thing we always recommend, this is something that we'll offer to, to your listeners as well. Yeah. Um, when a patient walks into your practice, you don't start treating them right away. I mean, I hope you don't, you know, yeah. it's an emergency patient. You're, you're doing a diagnostic workup. You're yeah. taking x-rays and perioprobing and restorative charting and cancer screening. Based on all of that, you put together a treatment plan. Then you go ahead and start treating the patient. Same thing with, with this. You don't know where you're at risk unless you actually look. Most dental offices, and this is not a knock, you know, dental, I was a periodontist for 10 years. You know, if I didn't specialize in IT the way I do now, 
I wouldn't know this, you know, all, all these things, but most dentists don't know how to actually evaluate their practice for their security risk. So in the past, we, we've been charging for this. For, for any of your listeners, they are more than welcome to um, have us do what we, we call a security audit, a technical audit. And people don't like the word audit, but it's, you know, it's, it's pretty thorough. It doesn't take long. It takes maybe, it takes us maybe 30 to 40 minutes. We only need the, the office for about five minutes or so just to get us onto the, the network um, so that we can gather data. But once we do that, we sit down with the, the office afterwards and say, okay, here's what we found. Uh, here's where you're vulnerable. Here's how we can help. Here are your options. Here's how, what all those different options would cost. There's never an obligation. You know, my role in all of this, of course, we would love to work with any, any of your listeners and we, you know, we would be thrilled for that opportunity. But at the end of the day, it's more critical to me that people understand where they're at and where they're at risk and what they need to do to mitigate that risk. And you know, what you do with that information is up to you. You wanna work with us, great. We work, you know, a lot of times when people say, well, but I've got an IT guy and you know, they take care of my stuff. Most IT guys aren't up on cybersecurity, HIPAA. Actually, a lot of Bell IT companies that we work with are not up on, on all this stuff. It's really been our focus over the last few years. Um, but we learned a long time ago how to play nicely with others. Um, there was no reason that if you have an IT company or person you're comfortable with, that you have to change that. You can say, hey, we want to keep them, but we understand just like, you know, you send your, you know, if, a, if someone's a general dentist, they probably don't do their own ortho. They don't yeah. necessarily place implants. They don't do, you know, their own perio surgery. They refer it out. Same thing. You know, we can be that specialist that fill in those gaps of where the practice is at risk, but you can still stick with your IT company. Uh, and that, as I said, we're offering it for free for any of your listeners. So you, you can go to my website, which is the digital dentist.com. The first thing you're going to see up there is, you know, yes, I, you know, yes, I'd like a free consultation. And you just put in your, your name and your phone number, your email. It goes to my office manager. She'll follow up with you and we can schedule that. And that's it. it it's, it's like I said, it's, it's really quick. It takes us 30 to 40 minutes. And then there's the follow-up call where 20, 30 minutes, I can go through everything with you. And, uh, and I would send you a full report, uh, you know, everything written up with all, all the information that you would need. And then you can decide how you want to proceed. But it's So to clarify too, I think that's another thing about winging it. You know, I think dentists think, oh, okay, I have a local IT guy in my practice. He sets up my network. He updates my uh, dental software. He puts in my firewall what's the difference between that guy and what you're doing? Or what's the, what's the gap there? Right. So we do all that stuff as well. We're full service. Yeah. IT. We've done that stuff okay. forever. What I found was that when the, you know, HIPAA has been around since 1996. A lot of people don't know that because they didn't start hearing about it for the last few years. Um, the high tech, which involves uh, electronic data, that was 2009. And then HIPAA really kind of became, you know, quote unquote a thing in 2013 when they passed the final rules. Um, one of the things I realized at that time, as we were talking to clients and talking to other IT providers, is that other dental companies weren't really focusing on this. And we felt it was an important thing because we had clients that were starting to get HIPAA audits. Back then, they were doing random audits. And we just felt, hey, this is something that we really want to provide for people. We should really you know, make sure that's part of our offerings. Over the years, even though HIPAA has still been you know, still very important, it's still the law of the land, so it's not really optional. But as ransomware started taking off about three, four years ago, we realized, hey, this is another area where we're not seeing a lot of focus from the IT people out there, but it's critical, um, obviously, for dental offices that they have protection. So I think what makes us unique or, or different is our focus on the HIPAA cybersecurity end of things. Yes, we have plenty of offices where we provide all their IT, you know, 24-7, you know, everything they would need. But we do have the occasional offices that listen, I've got an IT person that I'm comfortable with. They're local, you know, they're around the corner. They can be here if there's a hardware issue, great. But they don't know how to do a formal risk assessment and develop a management plan. You know, they don't have that three-pronged approach to preventing ransomware. They've never heard of application whitelisting or ring fencing. You know, this, this is not something that they do. And in those cases, we say, great, we'll work with them. You know, let's get them on board. We'll provide the service, we'll monitor. 
If it's something that you need, we need a local IT person there to help us with, we'll contact them. You know, we're all a team here. We're all, you know, the, the goal is the same for most dental offices is that we want dentists to be able to have the peace of mind to sleep well at night, knowing their most critical asset, which is their patient data is protected. You know, that's the bottom line. So whatever it takes to get there, uh, we're happy to be part of that process. So let me give you a specific example. I have a client who's, unfortunately, their IT guy passed away. And so they were, you know, scrambling, looking for a replacement because their perception is I need somebody in my office putting my computers together in my network. When I need a new server, they're going to come in and install the server and put it together. Are you saying that you could be that type of person too with the hardware in the practice as well? Yeah, 90% plus of my clients are out of state. The vast majority, none of my team have ever met in person. Wow. So um, we've developed these systems over the 20 plus years I've been doing this, where the equipment can come to us, especially the server, which really requires a lot of uh, configuration. We do initial configuration in our office. We send it to the, to the practice. All they have to do is plug it in. Mm. Now we do have the occasional office that says, you know what? I'm not comfortable opening up the boxes and, you know, I don't want to plug it in. I may screw it up. We also have some offices that say, Hey, you know, like in your case, my, my local guy passed away, you know, am I going to need someone local occasionally? Now the answer for the most part is no, because of the fact that we use, like, for example, we use Dell for our hardware. Dell has local techs all over the country. When we buy a server from Dell, it comes with a four hour contract. They have to be there within four hours to replace a part. So, you know, we, we know we got that. However, there's always that occasional time for us on average, it's one to three times a year across all our clients, not per client, where we do need some feet on the ground that we've tried to resolve it remotely. It's not a hardware issue, but it's something we need someone in the office. We have a network of around 2,500 IT people we work with pretty much blanketing all of North America, that if someone needed, you know, feet on the ground that we need to get someone in the office within 24 hours, we could get someone there. So, um, gotcha. us 99.99% of the issues we can do remotely. So between us, you know, handling things remotely, Dell coming out, if there was a hardware issue, plus access to a local person in those rare circumstances where you need someone, we've got all the bases covered. So you don't, it, it's, change completely. You don't need local IT. That was the case five, 10, 15 years ago where that was just kind of the, yeah. the standard here, but almost, almost all of us now in IT have clients all across, you know, the, the country. Awesome. For me, I've got all across North America because I'm Canadian and I've got lots of Canadian clients. So um, we, we cover our bases, but yeah, it's the, the days of having that, you know, plus if for most offices, you think of it, they're paying for that time. You know, you whether you that, use it or not, whether you use it or not, they're paying or, money every month. But even if you're paying for, you know, only as you use it, yep. you're paying travel time. So you're paying yep. for the guy to come out and drive over half an hour, 45 minutes, sit in the office for a few hours, you know, leave. You're paying for all that time versus you call us up, you know, 30 seconds later, we're logged into your network. We're resolving the issue when we're out. And, you know, you, you spent a fraction of what it would have cost of bringing someone locally. So this is off off the beaten path of the dentist, but the, maybe there's a dentist listening to this who is more remote, who says, and I wish my local IT guy was in this, you know, digital dentist network. Are you, do you bring on IT guys into your fold? Does that work or no? Yeah, we we, said we keep a database. There are actually um, portals out there for managed service providers, which is what we are, where they have a network, you know, they have their own networks of people that they deal with and they can get, it's almost like an Amazon where people get rated and, you know, uh, we've used that system maybe four or five times in the last few years uh, for various things, you know, to bring someone local. We've always had good luck with them um, because they're not really doing stuff on their own. I mean, they get to the office, the first thing they do is to call us up and we start walking and they're the ones that are actually, you know, opening up the case and, and doing the stuff that we need to. They're not working independently you know they're they're working in conjunction with it they're just they've got the skills to noodle around inside of a computer case which a lot of dental offices have no desire to be you know <laughs> opening up the case and uh pulling out ram chips and swapping hard drives and all that stuff you know that's what we need those people for got it got it well this has been awesome so 
here's what I'm thinking right now. If I'm listening to this, I'm a dentist. I just want to be certain that whatever I'm doing, it's working. So I'm going to go to digitaldentist.com, register for the free consultation, make sure everything is figured out, sit with you, review my treatment plan, review what's going on with you and decide from that point, how much involvement can I use digital dentists to help support either what I already have, completely replace it or fill the missing blank that's always been there. Does that sound about right? Yeah, yeah. the website is thedigitaldentist.com. Okay. Uh, people can find me if they go to Facebook or Twitter, or LinkedIn, I'm on all those platforms, you know, just search for the digital dentist or Lauren Levine. And there's lots of ways you can reach out to me. The website's the easiest um, at the day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they say, you know, we don't charge for that time. We're happy to give you, you know, some guidance, what you need. Of course, we would love to work with you and, and provide those services. But if it's not the right fit for you, you've got more information than you had an hour before that, that you can then decide, you know, what's the best path forward for your practice. No brainer, no brainer. All right. So www.thedigitaldentist.com. I guess I don't have to say HTTP colon backslash, but I don't feel that right. Uh, with the yes, <laughs> it's a secure site, but yes, it's uh, <laughs> you can put that in. Little uh, uh, tech humor for just the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be funny if it wasn't a secure site though, huh? Yeah. No, not so much, but not so much. Uh, all right. So call to action is there for you guys who are listening. Obviously, if you want more information about All-Star Dental Academy, please email Heather at allstardentalacademy.com. She is more than willing to help you out. She's amazing. She'll take great care of you and direct you in, in the right way. And so thank you guys so much for joining us and really just taking the time to invest in yourself. If you listen to this, you know, understanding what it means to be a business owner and entrepreneur. So until next time, go out there and be an all-star. <laughs>